Well, welcome back. So let's talk about Romanesque art. So first of all, when we start talking about Romanesque art, what we mean is art from about the end of the 10th century up into about the middle of the 12th century. There's no hard breaks on when Romanesque starts or when Romanesque ends. Uh, in fact, Romanesque is not even a term that was invented at the time. The people had no name for the kind of art they were creating. They just called it art. Romanesque is a term of art historians have been applying since the 18th century. And what we mean by that is art that isn't Roman, but is Roman-like. That there was this movement from about the 10th century onward towards an art style that more exemplified the high art of Rome. So just like the Carolingian Renaissance was trying to revitalize art that way, you see that more and more these cultures are trying to revitalize the art of Rome. But of course, it's not going to be a, a revival. It's not a pure revival of Roman styles. It's going to be Roman-esque. It's going to have semicircular arches, columns, the kind of things that Romans had. The big one is going to be vaulting, a return to vaulting, like barrel vaults and groin vaults, like we saw in the uh, bathhouses of Rome in the Baths of Caracalla, that's going to come back. So these attributes are going to come back, but of course this is now a Christian medieval country, a Christian medieval world, it's going to be inflected. So let's talk a little bit about timelines. So we talked about the Viking expansion before, and that goes well into the 11th century. We'll talk a little bit about uh, the Normans, uh, because they're actually very influential in this spread of Romanesque art. We have the Etonians uh, overlapping the same time period. So the Etonians and Vikings actually overlap into this Romanesque period. We kind of have an end to the Viking era with the Battle of Hastings and the Norman invasion. Uh, there's something going on around the year 1000, and I'm just going to basically uh, go through it very quickly because we really honestly don't know what it is. There's a slowdown. There's a decrease in economic activity. There's lots of reasons for this. Uh, one could be the Viking expansions themselves. There was war, there was famine, there was also plague, uh, and there was a number of other things. Uh, there's also this suspicion that maybe Christians were expecting the end of the world. Uh, 1,000 is a good round number. I know back in the year 2000, there were plenty of people expecting the end of the world. It didn't end up happening, and it's not going to happen now. I've been through several ends of the world. I've been through 2000, Y2K, 2012, uh, internet neutrality. I mean, it's all, I've been through it all. I'm going to survive it. I'm going to survive this one too. But perhaps maybe that it makes you appreciate the anxieties of people. They thought it was going to be the second coming of Christ. And so for that and a variety of reasons, we see a real decline in massive buildings. There aren't a lot of big uh, buildings built around the year 1000, but something interesting happens once we get past the year 1000, either because there's a let up in the violence or there's an increase in economic activity. People say, hey, it's not the end of the world. They start building again. So it's really the 11th century where we see architecture really start to take off and we start seeing the great cathedrals of Europe being built. Another thing that's happening around this time, the First Crusade. So that's another important historical event because you have crusaders leaving Western Europe and Northern Europe and going to the Eastern Mediterranean. They're coming into contact with other cultures. They're seeing other architectural styles, and this is causing a great deal of influence. The Crusades is a phenomenon that will go uh, on for centuries, but the big ones are going to be the First Crusade, the Second Crusade, and the Fourth Crusade, where they actually end up conquering Constantinople. One of the big things that happens because of the Crusades is you have these kings leaving their countries behind. You have Richard the Lionhearted, you have Louis VI of France, uh, you have some of the biggest and most powerful rulers of Europe going off to the Holy Land to fight the Crusades. Well, that means they have to leave someone in charge, and in France that character was Abbot Suger. And so Abbot Suger uh, was an abbot of Saint-Denis, and he rebuilds Saint-Denis in 1144. That's really important because that's generally regarded as the first Gothic structure. So without the Crusades, we would never have had Gothic art. And so this is the period of the great cathedrals of Europe, and we roughly break this down between the Romanesque and the Gothic. Again, no hard dates here. But the Romanesque is going to go from the 10th century into about the middle of the 12th century, 
and then Gothic is going to take over. Romanesque is a generalized phenomenon. It starts everywhere simultaneously, but it's the first true international style, the first true historical international style, but it's going to be replaced by the Gothic. Now, while the Romanesque kind of grows up in Spain and and Germany and France and Italy kind of equally, and it's very diverse, the Gothic has a birthplace, and that's going to be France. That's going to be in the Ile de France. That is the regions immediately around the environs of Paris. And so about by the middle of the 12th century, we're no longer in the Romanesque, we're moving over to Gothic. But there's a lot of bleed through here. There's a lot of overlap between these two areas. And then, of course, by the time we hit the 13th century, we have the Mongolian conquests, which come into Eastern Europe. They actually conquer Baghdad. It's amazing to think about it. And so this is going to be another uh, point where we have these hard historical breaks. So say what you want about today and all the things we're struggling through. We're not struggling through the Crusades. We're not struggling through the Norman Conquest and the Mongolian Conquest. Things could be worse. Knock on wood. Knock on wood. Is there wood? Okay, there's wood. All right, moving on. So one of the things that changes as we move up into the year 1000 is this recovery of vaulting technology. So let me just remind you, we've looked at quite a few buildings. Uh, basilicas, these early Christian churches that we're seeing, are going to have wooden trust roofs. These are wo roofs made out of wooden timbers, beams, uh, and they're flat roofs. This one is uh, San Apollinarian Classe, which we took a look at back in the Byzantine section. But here's another example. This is St. Michael's at Hildesheim, which we looked at in the uh, Carolingian and the Etonian period. This one has panels, but it's still a flat wooden roof. But we see that people are moving towards vaulting. And it starts in very, very small ways and small places. Remember, Romans had vaulting. They created these enormously vaulted roofs made out of masonry and concrete in places like the Basilica Maxentius. Uh, where you have this huge vaulted roof. But vaulting had pretty much died out in the Middle Ages, uh, largely in part because of lack of economic funds, lack of skill, but also it just wasn't needed for these relatively small buildings. But we start to see a return to vaulting, and the vaulting is in very humble small buildings like this, Santa Maria del Naranco. This is uh, a Visigothic church in Spain. Now, this is a teeny little church. In fact, most of the church is actually uh, not really meant to be used in everyday use. In fact, you can see, and you can see it right over here, we have a little altar. And that altar was meant to officiate for outdoor gatherings. So let me grab the pen here. I can highlight that for you. So here you have the altar. Most people would gather outside. So the interior of the church is only for the most sacred masses. Uh, but because they were running out of wood, the interior of the church doesn't have a trust roof. It has a vault. This is a masonry structure. And of course, a barrel vault is one of the simplest vaults you can do. It's essentially an arch that's been stretched along the long dimension. To do this, you have to have centering. That is, you have to have some kind of scaffolding or support to support this until the arch goes in but once it's locked in you can remove the scaffolding and you have this free supported tunnel or barrel vault now again it seems like the motivation for this is they just were running out of timbers uh, most of europe by the year 1000 was kind of denuded uh, they'd cut down all the big trees uh, and they were using coppicing or other kind of uh, forestry techniques to make things like charcoal or wood to burn, there wasn't a lot of large timbers. So if you need to cover a roof, you got to go back to the old ways. And so here you can see how they built this with ribs and then this infill masonry. Another example built right around the year 1000 is St. Martin de Conigou. This is a monastery built high up in the Pyrenees uh, on the borders between France and Spain. And here you can see they have a very simple barrel vault. Uh, you can see by the size of the pews that this is not a very big church. It's a teeny little church. But it does show this return to barrel vaulting technology. Once we get back to barrel vaulting technology, 
it starts to become a little bit more complicated. They actually start to build larger and larger churches. And this is where you start to see some fun experiments. Here's one of my favorite examples. Um, this is uh, the church at saint Philibert in Tournos, France. And you can see in this case, instead of doing a single barrel vault that goes over the length of the nave, such as we see here, this is the simple single barrel vault, they wanted windows. <laughs> so they decide, hey, uh, let's make barrel vaults, but let's make them transverse barrel vaults. So the barrel vaults actually run this way. And that allows you to put in these windows. The problem is, is well, then you need something to hold up the barrel vaults. So they build these transverse arches, which cross here. You can see it a little bit better in this example. You have this transverse arch, and then you have a barrel vault that runs this way. Notice we actually have groin vaults, cross vaults, in the side aisles. You can see those cross vaults, those groin vaults. Well, this is still conceived of kind of like a Roman building. Notice we have these massive piers here, but the piers are round, and the difference between a pier and a column is a column is usually made up of single pieces of stone, monolithic blocks of stone, or drums, whereas a pier is really like a wall, but it's made out of many different blocks of stone. Uh, so there is a kind of articulation here of a column and a capital, but notice that we have a transition to these transverse arches, so we need something to carry that, so they actually create a little kind of short column there with a little column capital on top of it. So there's still the sense of the vocabulary of the Greco-Roman world. There's still a sense of this classical vocabulary but they got to cludge it to fit the new architecture. Uh, it's really kind of fun. Well, let's uh, go and take a look at really a remarkable kind of uh, work of art and historical document as well. And that is this document we call the Bayou Tapestry. Now, we call this a tapestry, but it's technically not a tapestry. Uh, a tapestry is actually uh, woven. This is technically uh, wool and silk embroidery on linen, so it's actually uh, more like a uh, needlepoint or embroidery. But we call it a tapestry, and it's a gigantic thing. It, uh, it's more than 280 feet long. Uh, in the museum today it wraps around three different walls, uh, and it's about uh, four feet high, so it's really quite involved. And it tells the story of uh, the conquest of England by the Normans. So remember, you have the Vikings. The Vikings come in, they conquer large chunks of England, but they also conquered the northern uh, France. Uh, the French kings and uh, Charlemagne decided to give them a big chunk of France to buy them off, and they become kind of vassals to the French state. But they also set up their own kind of autonomous state and they also intermarry with England. Well, a guy comes along who's known as William the Bastard, uh, because he was an illegitimate son of the previous king, and he makes a claim to the throne of England, and this brings him into conflict, and eventually he goes over and he conquers it, and this starts the Norman uh, dynasty. So we have uh, really kind of a flat graphic style. Uh, all of this is done uh, here. You see the coronation of King Harold, uh, this is the Norman army of William at sea. Notice that their ships are longboats, that even though we are Christianized at this point, these guys are still the descendants of Vikings and are very much like Vikings. Here is a depiction of the Battle of the Hastings. The Battle of Hastings is, is really a fun kind of violent scene. And of course, it records one of these great military histories uh, where the Normans had the stirrup, uh, the... Anglo-Saxons didn't have the stirrup, and the stirrup allows you to stand up in the saddle and really uh, aim your lance and your sword blows really well. I love how we have the bodies laid out here, even have a spare head. <laughs> here we see the horses crashing into each other, tumbling end over end. It's like a scene from Braveheart. Here's another severed head. We have griffins and other animals decorating in the margins. So the Norman conquest was one of these things that brought 
uh, the control of England under the Normans, and every king of England since then has been descendant of William the Conqueror. Uh, when you conquer a country, you get upgraded from the title of William the Bastard and you become William the Conqueror. And uh, Queen Elizabeth today is something like the 29th generation removed. She's like the 29th great-grandchild of William the Conqueror. It's quite a legacy. Uh, but it also brings French and Latin customs over into England, really has this tremendous impact on England. Uh, William the Conqueror, for his part, built a lot of forts in England, and the most famous is still standing. It's the Tower of London. And here you can see he brings with it this kind of Romanesque style. Uh, we have semicircular arches. Things are organized into bays. This thing has a chapel. And notice that even though these aren't solid columns, they're made up of individual ashlar bricks, so they're piers, they are conceived of as classical columns with capitals, bases, semicircular arches, one over the top of each other. So you see this influx of these ideas from the continent coming in. There's a very, they built churches on both sides of the English Channel, uh, and this is one of the more important. This is saint Atien, uh, which is St. Stephen, uh, and this is built in Caen in France. Uh, now you can ignore almost everything up there. That's all later Gothic additions. But notice that it does employ the Westwerk, or the West facade, that was part of the innovations of the Carolingians and the Etonians. In its plan, it has a Latin cross plan. So it has a Western facade. It has a Latin cross plan with a transept. It has an apse. We haven't talked about chevets yet, but this is later, so we'll talk about that later. But one of the great innovations is the interior elevation. So elevation refers to the interior vertical uh, aspect of a building. And here you have an interesting problem. You have a gallery, and the gallery is on top of the lower aisles, but you want to integrate this entire building together. You want it to all seem seamless. How do you integrate that? How do you organize the interior of a building. Well, you do it by emulating past Roman architecture. And so here you can see how they're doing that. They're doing that by using semicircular arches and columns. The ultimate source of inspiration for this is going to be the Colosseum. This is the elevation of the Colosseum. Notice how the Colosseum was organized into repeating bays. The bays have engaged columns attached to piers with semicircular arches. So this is very much evocative of the Colosseum. And you can see the comparison here. Repeating bays, a rhythm of repeating bays, semicircular arches, engaged and attached columns that line up with each other. It's kind of amazing to think that the ultimate inspiration of a lot of these Christian cathedrals and churches was coming from uh, a Roman arena designed for blood sport. But there are a few distinctions. One of the biggest distinctions is, notice how the columns are different. Here, the columns are superimposed right over the top of each other, but you have this large architrave that goes through. Here, the artist has done something really intriguing. Notice these are actually classical column capitals. They have little classical tops. These are Corinthian column capitals right here. But this column capital has been stretched so that it goes the full length from floor to ceiling, really emphasizing this vertical dimension. Whereas here, the emphasis is on the horizontal. Yes, there are vertical bays, but because those columns are broken every single level, they don't continue the vertical uh, feeling going up. So that's what's going here. It's an amazing innovation to take this column and stretch it. Now that's something I don't think any Roman would do, but there's the column capital, there's the base, and it's just been stretched across two stories. It's really unusual, but it does. It gives this wonderful vertical lift to the building. There's something else they've done here. They've taken the idea of engaged columns from the Romans, but they've, uh, you know, 
added it up to infinity. Notice that we have these individual archivolts. So it's not just one arch like there is here. There's multiple arches and every one of these springs from another column. So we have an engaged column that goes the full length of the building uh, up here, but inside each of these arches we have another arch with another column, and then in between that we have a little quarter column to kind of give this archivolt a place to spring from. So instead of a simple square pier with an attached column, you have a square pier with multiple little colonnettes attached to it making a very complex and dynamic form that we call a compound pier. So this compound pier and the innovation of the compound pier is really going to be something that takes off as we go later into uh, the Romanesque and eventually into the Gothic. And again, you can see how this starts as a Roman idea. It's taking that inspiration, but it's metastasized. It's being uh, expanded and being really played with in a fun way. Now this vaulting up here, you can ignore that. This building was originally covered with a wooden trussed roof. This was all added in later in the Gothic period. So this still didn't have a barrel vault. It would have looked in many ways much like an early medieval church, but with this wonderful interior elevation borrowing on things like the Colosseum and Roman columns and, and creating these wonderful compound piers. Well, now we need to talk about a very interesting phenomenon going on, going around uh, in the medieval world. So the medieval world had developed this practice of relics. What is a relic? Uh, if you are of Mormon or Protestant derivation, uh, a relic is going to be a pretty foreign concept to you. If you're Catholic or Orthodox, perhaps not. Uh, but a relic is a religious object. It is usually the bones or the remains, but it can sometimes be an object, like a close possession, of a holy individual. So, for example, um, there are no bodily relics of the Virgin Mary, but there's a few relics of things like her belt or her shirt, things that were close to her. There are also bodily relics of saints that died. And an early practice develops in the 2nd and 3rd century, where a belief was that if you could get close to these relics, you would receive some kind of blessing or some kind of supernatural help from the relics. You see this early in Rome. Uh, people want to be buried close to the bones of Peter. That's why St. Peter's had that necropolis underneath it that we talked about. So if you are a person who is a Christian who wishes to revere these relics, uh, what are your choices? Well, there's the holy sites associated with uh, Jesus and Mary are always going to be the most important holy sites. They're the ones that you're going to want to visit, and most of those are in the Holy Land right here, right down here. It's a bit of a problem, however. Um, since the 8th century, most of this territory here and all of the holy sites are under the control of Muslims. Now, Muslims still allowed Christians to go to the holy sites, but they weren't exactly careful to protect the pilgrimage routes. And so if you were an individual traveling on this way, you could be easily way, waylaid by uh, bandits or etc. Plus, even if it wasn't under the control of Muslims and difficult to get to, it's very expensive to travel from Western Europe all the way across the Mediterranean to the holy sites, to the site of the nativity, the birth of Christ, the site of his crucifixion, and the site of his resurrection. So if you're going to go and see relics of holy people, what's your next best option? Well, your next best option is Rome, and Rome is down here. Uh, and Rome is, of course, the sites where many Christian saints were martyred. This is the sites where the relics of both Peter and Paul were located at, and you could go and visit them. The problem there is that you may notice there is this yellow border here. This is the Holy Roman Empire, and the Holy Roman Empire was often at war with France and Burgundy. So that means if you're an individual traveling down here, 
you actually have to cross into enemy territory. And again, it's expensive. It's not an easy thing to do. So if you are a Christian who believes in the practice of relics and in the practice of pilgrimage, this religious journey to holy sites to receive blessings, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to go look for things that are closer by. And in fact, an entire industry develops to provide Christians with the relics that they need. And if you can't go to the relics, or if a city can't go to a relics, they will figure out how to bring the relics to them. These relics are the most sacred objects in medieval Christianity, and they go to great lengths to protect them. Reliquaries are made out of gold and silver and enamel. They're made out of the highest quality uh, you know, materials. This is uh, the relics of Saint Foy, and this one is made into the shape of the saint himself. But see, it's just absolutely encrusted with jewels. It has a little door there with a little crystal so that you can actually look in and see the relic or you can open the door and take a look at the relic. Sometimes these relics would get quite gruesome. This is an arm reliquary. This is the forearm of a saint. Uh, and it has a little door there so you could look at his radius and ulna. <laughs> uh, as I mentioned, sometimes these get quite gruesome. Uh, this is one of my favorite relics. This is the head of Mary Magdalene. And it has a glass dome over the skull. And normally when this is closed, there's a golden face over the top of this, but uh, it's removed so people can actually get access to the relic. Uh, relics continue to be a major thing today amongst the Orthodox and the Catholics. When I went to Mount Athos, uh, when I was doing my dissertation and research there, um, they actually uh, said, would you like to see our relics? And they had a number of local saints and they brought the relics out. And uh, that was a, a great honor. I was, I was very pleased. Uh, I actually got a chance to get close to the golden coffin of um, St. Catherine of Alexandria, whose relics are now housed at St. Catherine's uh, Monastery, which is named for her. There was a, an incredible mania for these relics in every way. Uh, people actually went to great lengths to steal these relics. Uh, relics, the most important relics, are of course those relics that are associated with the lives of Jesus and Mary. But uh, any relics from any saint or any holy person would do. Uh, in fact, whole cities would go to war with each other to retrieve relics, or they would send spies to purchase relics or to sneak relics out. Uh, these are, this is the story of the translation of the relics of St. Nicholas of Myra. And yes, this is that St. Nicholas. This is Santa Claus. So St. Nicholas was a bishop in Myra, which is in the south uh, western coast of, of modern-day Turkey in Anatolia. Uh, but the city of Bari, uh, which is in Italy, went there, uh, stole his relics, and snuck them back to Italy. So if you want to go see uh, good old St. Nick's relics, they're in Italy. Uh, and Mira has never forgiven it. Uh, the same thing happened in Venice. Uh, Venice uh, went to Alexandria and stole the relics of St. Mark, who was one of the evangelists who wrote the book of, of Mark, and they took him back to Venice, uh, which is why the basilica there is named for St. Mark. So people actually fought wars over these things. Uh, when you went to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, uh, they would allow pilgrims to lean over and to kiss the true shards of the cross. But they had to stop that practice because they found that people were actually biting the true shard of the cross to take splinters back, to take pieces of the relic. Uh, and so a huge trade developed in relics. And like in all things, uh, the scammers and the frauds come in. And so there were people selling fake relics and uh, people raiding catacombs for relics. Uh, if you've ever read um, Canterbury Tales by Chaucer, uh, you have the Pardoner. And the Pardoner is an absolutely disreputable, slimy character. And one of the things he does is he sells relics. So even in the Middle Ages, people knew that a lot of these relics were fake. Uh, Mark Twain joked that if you took all the true shards, fragments of the true shards of the cross in Europe, you'd have enough wood to build a cathedral. Uh, there was uh, one monk, I remember, who was discussing uh, that uh, there are three heads of the John the Baptist that claim to be the real head. They can't all be the real head. One of the heads claims to be the 
head of the 12 year old john the baptist i don't know maybe he was like shedding them like uh, uh you know lizards shed skin it's just absurd uh but it's very important to note that for a lot of people this was a very important practice and continues and a lot of these relics do have very good provenance that we know that um, they probably are from the actual people and they have a long-standing tradition and they have a long history of uh, miracles associated with them when i was in uh, Thessaloniki, uh, that's where you can find the relics of St. Demetrius. St. Demetrius is this very important early military saint. And to this day, they will still pour oil into his sarcophagus and it will pour over the body and they'll recover it and put it in a vial so that you can carry the vial. So that somehow by the oil touching the sacred body, you carry something of that supernatural or spiritual or divine uh, power away with you. And of course, there was the belief that if you did this, this was a way to procure penance. This was a way to be forgiven of your sins, to find grace. So while it was very, very difficult to get to places like the Holy Land and Rome, there was a place that many, many pilgrims, even poor pilgrims, could get to. And that was Santiago de Compostela. Santiago de Compostela was probably the most important pilgrimage site of all of Western Europe. Now remember, most of Spain at this time, everything below this line, is still under Muslim control, but everything up here was still Christian. And you have the kingdoms of Castile, Leon, Aragon. Uh, and so for most of the people living in France, this was the sacred uh, destination of choice. You could travel down these roads and literally thousands of people would go on the Camino, the, the route uh, to Santiago de Compostela, and they would travel uh, down this road. They would stop at hostels and places for pilgrims. Some of them were poor and walked the whole way. Uh, others were uh, rich and brought whole entourages and carriages. Everybody believed in this. Santiago de Compostela is St. James the Major, uh, and he was believed, he's often called St. James the Moor Slayer, it was believed that it was his relics that prevented this part of Spain from being conquered by Muslims. And so a magnificent and gigantic church develops there. Now this church today is covered by a massive Baroque facade, so it's kind of hard to see the original church, but there is a Romanesque church in there. You can see that it has the westwork, the western facade. When you get to the interior, it's a little less uh, altered, but you can see that it has a barrel vault and it has these beautiful compound piers with these long colonnettes that go all the way up to the springing of the arches. One of the things that's associated with pilgrimage is the scallop shell, uh, Coquille Saint Jean. Uh, so you would go down, there were guidebooks written for pilgrims, you would go down to Santiago de Compostela, you would go see various sites, you'd revere the relics, and then you'd actually go to the seashore. And there was a particular kind of scallop shell that was there that uh, didn't exist anywhere else. And you'd pick up a scallop shell and you would take it back with you. You'd often wear it around your neck. And this would be an emblem that you had made the pilgrimage. And sometimes people would actually carve these into the walls. This one's carved into a wall so that people would know that they had made the pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela. Uh, Pope Benedict XVI actually, again, remember he's this great reviver of medieval traditions, he actually made the pilgrimage himself. And here you can see him wearing a humble pilgrimage cloak. And the cloak has the cross of Santiago, uh, and it also has one of these uh, scallop shells on it as well. So I want you to think about this logically for a minute here. You have literally thousands of people traveling down these roads to Santiago de Compostela to receive blessings from this saint. This is by far the most popular pilgrimage destination. So these are um, religious uh, individuals, but they're tourists. They are there to see the religious sites. They're religious tourists, but they're still tourists. And if you're a tourist, you have to spend money. You have to buy food. You have to find shelter. You have to uh, arrange transportation as you travel down these roads. Now, if you are a town uh, in one of these roads and you have thousands of people coming through 
you're not just going to let those people go through and do nothing. You're going to try and get them to stop in your town and empty out their pockets, uh, you know, buy little souvenirs. People did. They bought pilgrimage souvenirs. Uh, you go to Disneyland or New York City, you have to buy a souvenir. Uh, people have always bought souvenirs, and uh, they bought religious souvenirs, too. Uh, for example, when people went to Chartres, Chartres had the chemise of the Virgin, which was the undershirt of the Virgin Mary, and you would buy a tiny little copy of the chemise, and the chemise, the copy of the chemise would be pressed to the chemise, so it would kind of carry something of its spiritual energy away with it, and so you'd buy little souvenirs like that. So the, the one constant is, even if you're doing something entirely spiritual for the benefit of your soul, uh, there's still going to be capitalism. <laughs> there's still going to be somebody trying to sell you something. So you have all these people coming down these roads. What do they want? What they want is more relics. That's what they want. They want to see more relics. And if you have, if they're all expecting a big fancy church, you're going to build a big fancy church. And so think about what's happening. Every single one of these towns, every single one of these towns, Conk, Peregru, Poitiers, Tours, uh, Toulouse, uh, Saint-Guillaume, Arles, all of them are going to be building big churches. They're going to be building big churches and they're going to be getting relics. Again, some of these towns would go to the next town over and raid their relics just so they could have prestigious relics. And you're going to build big fancy churches. It's important to note that these churches are far bigger than the local population actually needs. This is far more than you need for everyday church. You are doing this because you want to get the tourists in there. And so you want to accommodate as many pilgrims as possible. Plus, you want to show off your town. You want to prove that your town can actually build a really big fancy church. So a lot of this is about civic pride. So if you have all of these communities trying to get the pilgrims to stop in their town, uh, that means you have a lot of architects, you have a lot of stonemasons, you have a lot of craftsmen traveling back and forth up and down these roads. You know, one church gets finished building, to just move down to the next town and say, hey, I'm a stone mason, I'm a stone carver, uh, what do you need? And you're going to go to work in the next town over. So if you have craftsmen traveling and architects traveling back and forth, they're going to run into different groups because, you know, one stone mason may go north, one stone may go south, but you'll have a different group collecting and they're going to trade ideas and they're going to see, hey, I liked what you guys did over there. I'm going to copy that. And so slowly, over the course of a century, you see an international style emerge. This isn't planned. This is just one of those emergent phenomenons where you have all of these stonemasons and architects working and going up and down these roads, seeing what they like, seeing what they don't like, and saying, hey, let's fix that up. Let's do that. Oh, I liked what they did over there. Let's do that. And a kind of consensus emerges over what these churches should look like. All of the innovations that develop everywhere start to come together. So Santiago de Compostela, strangely enough, because it was so popular for so long, gets rebuilt so many times that it's actually not one of the best demonstrations of what this style looked like in the 11th and 12th century. Uh, but there is a church at Toulouse. Uh, it's a church of saint Cernan, and it's located right here. Uh, and it was very popular during the Middle Ages, but then its popularity waned off, so the building wasn't changed very much. So it's actually an excellent example of what this mature pilgrimage Romanesque style looks like. And so this is what we call the mature Romanesque or the pilgrimage road uh, Romanesque or the international Romanesque. They all basically mean the same thing, that people by traveling these pilgrimage roads had developed a set of ideas of what these churches should look like. And saint Cernan is a really good example. So let's take a look at saint Cernan. So saint Cernan has semicircular arches. It has a monumental portal to accommodate lots of pilgrims. Notice that we have columns and colonnettes and archivolts. This was meant to have two big western towers. They just never got around to finishing it. They again ran out of money. Uh, things happen. Notice it has a large window on the facade as well. Now, you can see this part was probably finished last, so it has a little bit of variation. You can actually see where construction stopped because they moved from stone and brick to just pure brick. 
uh, above that. But it's very representative of what these early churches, uh, these early Romanesque churches would have looked like. When we look at the plan, the plan is a Latin cross plan. It has a transept. It has a nave. Uh, it has an apse. Well, the apse is a little bit more developed. Uh, it has two side aisles. Uh, and you can notice it has these massive western towers and these huge uh, bases. And although they never built them, they obviously intended them to be built. When we look to the interior elevation, you can see that they are borrowing from the innovation of sites like saint antion at Caen, uh, developed by the Normans. So we have compound piers, and we have those beautiful colonnettes that go all the way up. Uh, and think these are still conceived of as columns. They have little kind of Corinthian style columns and bases. They've just been stretched to give it this verticality. So here you can see we have the compound piers, the engaged columns that go all the way up to the vault. And over the top of the church, we have a barrel vault. So unlike San Filibert and some of those early experiments, rather than having a, a complex vaulting system that was kind of difficult to do, they have a single barrel vault. Notice how in this barrel vault, the colonnettes run right up into these ribs, and then these ribs cross over and right down the other side. It really unifies this building and brings it together. Notice this also creates a series of repeating bays that draw your eyes down to the altars. Uh, down to the altar and to the sanctuary. So there's two things going on here. There's a processional sense of space. It really pulls your eye towards the altar and kind of frames the altar. It also pulls your eye upward. But because that barrel vault uh, doesn't have any windows up there, it does tend to be rather dark. Uh, but it has this wonderful complex interplay of all of these kind of colonnettes and archivolts and compound piers. There's a couple other things that get added as well, and they're down here in the sanctuary end. And this is where we have the ambulatory and the chevet. So if you remember, back at Old St. Peter's, the altar was in the apse, and the apse was just a small little thing like that. And the whole purpose of the transept was to come into the transept get access to the relics for pilgrims, and then allow them to leave uh, cleanly without interrupting things. But now the altar had been moved into the transept itself, and this impeded the access of pilgrims. So you needed a way to give them access to the relics, and the relics had often been moved back here. And so they created this path that goes around the back of the apse and then can exit. And this is called the ambulatory. Uh, this is where you walk, this is where you ambulate. So this is the ambulatory. So you can walk around the back of the altars and still get close to the relics. But then they realized, hey, wait a minute. Now we've got a larger apse and we can put apsidoles, little tiny apses, on our big apse. So this is apseption, where you have lots of little tiny apses. And then they decided, hey, let's throw those on the transept. Those are good. And those are great because now we can have little smaller altars. And in those altars can be contained or displayed the relics of other saints. So, you know, hey, if one saint is good, uh, the relics of multiple saints is even better. And what this makes is a wonderful space a space of one large apse with an enlarged ambulatory and then smaller apses or apsidoles attached to it. It's almost like a fractal, fractal understanding of space. And it's not just beautiful from the outside, it's beautiful from the inside. You have this wonderful ambulatory vault. And in this case, they've used what we call cross vaults or groin vaults so that you can have windows to allow light to come in. Really wonderful innovation. And then we also have a crossing tower. A tower right over the top of the transept and the nave so that light can come down into the interior of the building. Now everything up here was added after the original phase. So we had three levels there. Still impressive tower and then they added more. So these features, the western facade, the west work, 
Latin cross plan, the crossing tower, and the apses and the ambulatory, which together make up this thing we call a chevet. Uh, these all come together in the mature Romanesque, along with compound piers, semicircular arches, barrel vaults, this wonderful repeating rhythm of bays and colonnettes in the interior. And it really does make for a very unified building. All of the themes, all of the arches work together to unify it. Uh, here's another example. This is saint Foy. This is in Conque. This is a little tiny abbey church. Uh, well, I guess it's not that tiny. It's actually quite a large church. Uh, but there's a little abbey there, a monastery, and it's not a very large community. And again, this church is far, far bigger than the community needed. This is built for the purposes of civic pride and for accommodating pilgrims. But you'll notice that it has a transept, a nave, so it's a Latin cross. It has a western facade, so you see these large western towers. It has a crossing tower, and it has an ambulatory and chevet. It's a little bit smaller than San Sernan but it's still quite large. So there's this beautiful front western facade. As we get into the interior, you can see that, yes, indeed, it has compound piers and the colonnettes that go all the way up to the springing of the arches. Those arches go into the vaults and curve around. We have a barrel vault. This is illuminated with artificial lighting today. Uh, it would have been quite dark in the Middle Ages, but still, really impressive. And then finally you have a crossing tower, and the crossing tower allows light to come down in. You have these four massive piers. Notice this is still conceived of as a Greco-Roman column. There's a capital up here, and there's bases at the bottom. So even though these compound piers have multiple elements, they're still, conceptually at least, they're going to be Greco-Roman. That's why we call this Romanesque. It doesn't really look like anything in the Roman world per se, but it's Roman-like. So when you look into the apse, you can look up into the chevet. You have this light coming in from the windows. Uh, you have the apse and the vaults going around. It's really quite lovely. Now, sometimes things are a little weird. You'll notice that the bays are not always the same size, but they all use semicircular arches. Uh, sometimes those arches are quite large. Sometimes they have to stick those arches up on little stilts to get them all to line up at the same height, but it does unify it together. Sometimes these buildings had to be built around existing structures, and so they accommodated it by being flexible in that way. The other thing that starts to happen on these Romanesque buildings, uh, particularly very early, is sculptural decoration. Now, normally in a Corinthian column capital, this would just be acanthus leaves. This would just be vegetal decoration. But here, they've decided to actually carve in stories. These column capitals have become places for narrative. So here we see the narrative of Abraham sacrificing Isaac. Uh, Abraham, very relatively primitively done, large head. Look at that knife. Ouch. Uh, and then here is the angel on the other side. It looks like they're going to split poor Isaac like a wishbone. In this story, Abraham is commanded to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. He does so faithfully, but then an angel jumps in at the last moment to say, no, we're not going to do that. Here seems to be a scene of the expulsion. This is the serpent. Notice the serpent has wings uh, and, so, and legs, but he is cursed to not have... He has to crawl on his belly after that. So this seems to be the serpent being expelled out of the Garden of Eden. Sometimes these scenes, though, are just decorative. These are a bunch of Norman soldiers. They have kite shields and Norman uh, helmets. What I love is these Norman helmets curve down. In Acanthus scroll work on Corinthian columns, these would be spirals, little volutes. But if you notice, their eyes have taken that position. So the artist here is being very, very clever, <clears throat> taking some of the ideas of some of these columns, but changing them up and making them figurative. So the introduction of figurative and narrative relief is really new. This is not something uh, we saw in the Roman period, at least not in these places, and it really shows that the medieval ages is, uh, the Middle Ages is really thinking about things. One of the main places for sculptural decoration is going to be in the tympanum. The tympanum is 
going to be this semi-circular lunette of masonry that acts as the lintel to the main doorway. So you have two doorways, a double doorway here, and a post supporting it. And this lunette, you have a semicircular arch, they're gonna like use that as a space for decoration. Now the lots of different decorations are used in this, but the most common is going to be what we call a maestas or a last judgment scene. And that's what we have here. We have a judgment scene. In the center we have Christ, who is judging the damned, and the people are being resurrected, and they're either being resurrected to a happy afterlife or to a sad afterlife. The reason for a last judgment over the portal kind of makes sense because, again, a lot of things didn't happen inside the church. It's been uh, noted that it's outside the church where court cases would be heard. Uh, remember, the church has kind of taken over the, the role of the civil judiciary in the Middle Ages. So you would be judged of the church. So just like you would be judged before a court of law, this is a, a scene of judgment to remind you of the final judgment. It also makes sense because as you entered this building, the building, the church itself, is supposed to represent the kingdom of God on earth. And so this is a way of you being judged. You would enter this building and you would say, hey, wait a minute. Uh, am I actually worthy to enter? You are supposed to judge yourself before you enter. And so it's very appropriate that you have the last judgment uh, right in front of the door just as you enter. So you can kind of quietly judge yourself. The whole thing is oriented around Christ. Christ is the largest figure and he's dead center and he's issuing judgment. Here we see in this detail you notice that some of the paint is still on it. All medieval sculpture was painted, and we sometimes think of it as being bland. Christ is in the attitude of judgment. Angels above him hold a cross, and angels below him hold candlesticks or scrolls. He is in a mandorla. This is a body halo shaped like an almond, and he has radiating light coming out in all directions. He holds up one hand on his right hand, and on the right hand is a gesture of blessing. And then down here, his left hand is down, indicating a gesture of condemnation. The blessed are being gathered to his right hand. If you read the Bible, he says that, you know, I'll put the sheep on the right hand and the goats on the left, which is a way of saying that the, the people on the right are going to be blessed, and they're going to get uh, eternal life and salvation, and the people on the left are going to be damned. And just immediately below him, we see a scene of resurrection. So we have angels here. I love this. This angel is uh, lifting the lid off of a, of a coffin saying, wake up, it's resurrection morning. <laughs> so you have angels waking the dead, and then the dead are led by the hand, and they're introduced to heaven. So heaven has a door here, and they're being taken by the hand and led into heaven. Uh, something else is happening over here on this side, but we'll, those are the damned. We'll talk about them in a bit. So the blessed are led into heaven. So they are opened up from their coffins, and they are introduced into the bosom of Abraham. So if you know your Bible, there's the story of the Bible where uh, Lazarus and Gyges is this very famous parable given by Christ. <clears throat> Gyges is the rich man, Lazarus is the poor man. Gyges uh, dies and winds up in hell, but Lazarus winds up in the bosom of Abraham, who is the Jewish patriarch, which is this kind of emblem of heaven. So you notice that everybody here, you wake up naked, but you are clothed in eternal glory, and you are ushered into the presence of the patriarchs. Uh, over here you see a chalice and you also see broken chains indicating you are freed. You have this individual here who is praying and is guided to the hand of the Lord that enters them in. And so here are all the blessed, here are all the saints that come in, and they are being ushered into the presence of Christ. Mary is first and foremost. I mean, you know, you know he's Jesus' mom, so he's probably going to be at the front of the list. But Peter is right behind, and Peter holds the keys. These are the sealing keys, so he has the power to seal in heaven and earth. And so you can see that there are Peter and Mary being ushered into the presence of Christ. 
But then we have the baddies, the people on the other side. Uh, and they do not get it so well. So in this case, instead of a gentle waking, somebody opening up your coffin and saying, hello, it's resurrection morning, you get a very rude awakening. Uh, demons uh, awake you with drums and hot coals and uh, other kind of torture I I items or musical instruments. Uh, they bite you on your head and they drag you out of your coffins naked and they ride you, uh, in some cases, they ride you like a bobsled down to hell in flames. This poor guy is having his tongue pulled out while this other demon is riding him like a bobsled. And then, instead of being led gently by the hand and clothed in eternal glory and entered into the bosom of Abraham, you are clubbed and beaten and fed uh, head first into the literal mouth of hell that then craps you out onto the other side. And here you are poked and prodded and dragged into all of the tortures of hell. And so here are the damn being dragged down to hell in various ways. I love this guy. This guy's being carried by a couple of demons uh, like he's a roast pig. Uh, and you can see the flames roasting his body. What's interesting about hell is that hell is full of a lot of interesting characters that you might not expect. This character is wearing armor and he is being pulled off of a horse. He is a knight. A knight is a person of privilege and power. You wouldn't think to see a knight uh, in hell. Uh, this person here, by his uh, hairstyle, is a ruler or a king, and he is set on flames so that he can be the foot warmer for the devil himself. <laughs> so, even kings wind up in hell. This one's really interesting. This guy who's kind of sitting in a bathtub of flames is having his tongue pulled out by a demon, uh, but he has a tonsure. A tonsure is a haircut worn by monks. So this is a man of the church. So we have a very interesting judgment scene. It says that it doesn't matter what your status is. It doesn't matter if you're a king or a knight or even a member of the clergy. Even those people are subject to the torments of hell if they do not repent, if they uh, do not live up to the standards of their uh, church or their obligation. So it's a very fun collection of images. It really does, let me go back to the full image, it really does give you this sense of the medieval concept of the afterlife, that everyone has to mind their P's and Q's, not just peasants, not just ordinary citizens. Anyone can become a saint and a blessed, and anyone can be damned to hell, uh, and you definitely want to be on this side. So imagine you're entering this church, you're going to think, yeah, I, I'm going to mind my P's and Q's. And so the sculpture of these Romanesque churches often tell many complex or multivalent stories. Again, this is something I'm going to stress time and time again. The Middle Ages is never, ever one thing. It's always got multiple layers of meaning.